And I don't know about you, but I, I think he stole my notes last night. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, the tradition partition. And uh, he stole my notes. So, um, but I do want to thank the Lord for the school this past year. I was blessed to go myself. Um, graduated this year. This has been a busy year for Jacob Anders. Graduations, proposals. She said yes. <laughs> Praise the Lord. She said yes. Amen. You're all invited. If you're wondering when, we don't know yet. <laughs> Sometime in the future. Amen. The Lord knows and uh, I'm going to let him and Haley work that out because they seem to have a real good handle on that type of stuff. But I am so thankful to be here. How about you? And um, I do want to get serious. I tend to joke a lot, but um, I do have a heavy heart today. And um, I want to deliver my soul. And I want to do the best that I can to encourage you, first and foremost, to begin making plans to go to BTI next year. Amen? Turn to your neighbors say, you can go if you want to. And you need to say it with that good southern drawl. And for our Spanish folks, it's easy. Just hang around in America long enough and you'll get that accent. Amen. Scripture says that, Brother Strong told us last night, if we only believe, God can make it possible. I know it seems impossible for some of our people to take two weeks off of work, and I'm finding myself in that place now, uh, entering in, into the workforce. I call it the big boy workforce. I've been in the little boy workforce for a long time, and entering into that. And I know that right now, through my eyes, it seems impossible for me to go to BTI this coming year. And that breaks my heart. But with God, all things are possible, amen? amen. Do you believe that? Amen. I'm going to see you there then, alright? I want to get into this today. Brother Strong talked about taking a couple of my minutes, and that's okay. That just means I get to take a couple... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I want to thank the Lord so much for uh, Brother Strong giving, giving me this opportunity um, on program. Thank the Lord so much. I want to echo the sentiments of many before me. We welcome Brother Solis and Sister Solis. And I'm not trying to be one of these preachers that speaks things into existence. But sometimes when people show up from out of state, it means they're going to be around a while. And I don't know. I've been asking Brother Strong to give me the list so I could type it up for him all weekend. And he hadn't given it to me yet. I told him I'd proofread it and have it perfect for him. And you know, Brother Strong, I can handle it. You know, so uh, he hadn't given it to me yet. But whether you all are here for the next year or just here for the convention, we welcome you. And we are so happy to have you. Brother Jason, as for you and your wife, we've still got some hurt feelings, but we love y'all too. And we are so thankful that y'all are here. And can we give them all a good hand? We love y'all so much, Brother Jason, Brother Solis, and... You're home now, and North Carolina is just a little bit prettier than California. And I've never been to California, so I can say that. I want to get started today. Bridging the gap of the tradition partition. How many knows what a partition is? It's something that divides. And how many of us can be honest enough today to say that there are still some divisions in the body? Amen? Maybe the Lord let this happen just for this moment. At this moment, I've got a few divisions in my body. Three to be exact. And they hurt. And you know, when it first happened, it really didn't hurt that much. My toes didn't hurt. But now what has started happening is there is some feeling that is starting to come back in those toes. And I'm praying, Lord, let them go numb again. Let them go numb again. Because once I start feeling them, the weight that I carry starts to hold a little bit more weight, if you will. <laughs> and for the first couple of days, other than the fact that I had a boot on, I really didn't feel the pain that the divisions in my body were causing me. But there's some broke toes on my body right now, in case you don't know. Three of them. And the longer they're there, the more that they hurt. 
In a natural body, though, my, my doctor has assured me if I'll leave well enough alone and be obedient and wear this, it will heal. Praise the Lord. And he's thankful for good old doctors. Luke was one. And he told me that if I would just take it easy, and I thank the world for the best camp nurse there's ever been, Sister Becky and her wonderful assistant, Sister Cindy. They can be a little mean sometimes if you don't follow their orders, but it's all out of love. <laughs> but they've assured me if I will just stay the course, don't do anything crazy, it will heal. But friend, I'm here to tell you that is not how it works in God's body. Divisions, if left well enough alone for long enough, are not just going to magically heal. Somebody tell me amen. amen. If anything, the divisions are just going to get worse. Amen. Because you and I are not always the most obedient patients. We don't leave things well enough alone. Maybe if we did, it would heal. But what happens though is one division turns into another division. Because we haven't quite mastered that part in James that tells us to bridle our tongues. And so what starts as a division between myself and Brother Daniel turns into a division between my family and Brother Daniel's family. And eventually it becomes a division between the Reasonable Church and the Rocky Mount Church. Come on. And what happens if one day, and I'm not speaking prophetically... What happens if one day a brother Daniel is one of these that is stolen away by the other states of this country? And he goes to pastor in Virginia or California or wherever. Shh, let me say, don't say that. What happens then is the division will then become from North Carolina to California. These divisions are not small things. Come on. And it's not just a small thing in terms of difference of likes and dislikes. I'm not talking about trivial things like that. I'm talking about deep things like hurt feelings. <laughs> that sounds like elementary school, don't it? But Paul said when we ought to be teachers, we have need that one teach us again. Brother Jason said it. Don't blame me. We get our feelings hurt too easily. But it goes even deeper than that. And it goes into what we believe. Come on. Scripture says that in the, when all of this wraps up and the Lord comes back, we will see eye to eye. All the Anders say, praise the Lord. We're going to look him straight in people's eyes. Amen. Praise the Lord. When the Lord comes back, we will see eye to eye. And he's not talking about stature. He's talking about being on the same page scripturally. Amen. That regardless of whether I'm in North Carolina or whether I'm in California, I hear the same message. I am preach the same gospel. And that is impossible if I find my preaching in anything outside of this. But Jacob, that's all you talk about is the word. Because I love it. Because it is what showed me Christ. Come on, somebody. Maybe you didn't see Christ through the Word. Raise your hand if you found Him in the Word. I'm thankful that I had a good pastor to teach me. I'm thankful that I have many of you in this building that I look up to that have taught me over the years. But what good would it have been for me if I did not find it for myself? And the wonderful thing about it was, was what my pastor taught me, what my overseers taught me, what my Sunday school teachers taught me, what my VOB leaders taught me. It was all in the Word. Yeah. Amen. But I don't know about you. I, I, let me get into this or I'm going to run out of time for real. I was talking, I had a recent conversation with a bishop in the church about the true blues of the church. Let me define what a true blue is. They're faithful. They love the church. They love her teachings. They love people. Even the ones that don't love them. They're not ashamed of the gospel. They display the fruits of the Spirit. They're not to one side. They don't believe in liberalism. They don't believe in legalism. They believe in church of God-isms. <laughs> Amen. Which is to say they believe in the Scriptures. Come on, somebody. Amen. They stay in the middle of the road with the Word. 
Raise your hand if you want to be a true blue. Amen. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm going to be bold enough to ask it. Brother Jason, you inspired me last night. Don't ask if they want to hear it. Just give it. We're going to do it anyway. Raise your hand if you believe you're a true blue. I wish y'all were up here. That tells you right there we've got some work to do. It's not prideful to raise your hand and say, I believe in the church. I believe in her teachings. And I believe I want to be faithful. Come on. Those are the things that drive us. I press toward the mark. Amen. Even Paul said, I don't believe I've necessarily attained it yet, but I sure am pressing. I want to be a true blue. How about you? I want some audience participation. I want you to call out. Let's call out five names of some true blues that have gone on before. Somebody in this section. Bill O'Dell. Amen. Somebody in this section. Melvin Creech. Amen. Somebody in this section. Brother West. Somebody in this section. James Anders. Can we say amen to that? Amen. They were true blues. Brother Sister Brenda, I, I still haven't got over the passing of Brother Bill. I miss him. I miss him so much. And when we go to Wilmington, it's just not right. I miss him. And if anything, I miss his love for people. Some people are so doctrinally smart, they forgot what it means to love people. I'm talking about bridging a gap in the church today. Bridging a gap. Friend, let me tell you something. When the Lord comes back, it's not going to be the old folks living one way and the young people living another way. Amen. And all the old folks are saying, yep, those young people are going to change. And all the young folks are saying, yep, those old people are going to change. God, let me say, let me change. Let it ring out from my heart, God. Let it start with me. Let me change. As I spoke with him, I began to share with him some of the burdens that were on my heart. How I felt that I had seen a gap emerging between the true blues found in different age groups. Let me say that again. I want to be on the same page. Between the true blues found in different age groups. There are true blue Church of God members in every age group. Come on. Saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. Love the church of God. And they're as old as some of you and they're as young as some of you. How many believes we've got some young true blues in the church? How many believes we've got some old true blues still in the church? And my job is not to say, get out of the way, old true blues. And your job is not to say, know your place, young true blue. My job is to say, Lord, let me be true blue for you. Let me be faithful. Let me be true. And I begin thinking and studying about ways to possibly bridge this gap. And the Lord hit me with the thought of a tradition partition. Listen. I believe most people in this building today have no issue with this. Come on. I believe what we have issue with sometimes is the way it is presented. Come on. Can I be so bold to say? I think most people in here don't have a problem with this. Maybe you do. I don't know. Talk to me. But maybe they have a problem and have been hurt by the way it has been presented. I got Sister Clem support. That's all I need right there. She said, well, that means you own to something. Come on. I believe if you will go to any young person or any old person that loves the church, and you present them the Word in a loving way, it will take root in their heart. Amen. Come on. Or any middle of the road person. Maybe they're not old, young, maybe just somewhere in the middle. Amen, mom and dad? They're not old yet. 
want to talk about a tradition. A tradition, the secular definition, is the transmission of customs or beliefs from generation to generation. And this is, you Google the word tradition, this is what comes up. I'm not making this up. Google it. It says, theologically speaking, it is a doctrine, excuse me, believed to have divine authority, though not in the Scriptures. A doctrine, let me make this very short, a doctrine not in the Scriptures. That's what Google says a tradition is. A doctrine not in the Scriptures. Friend, the church of God has no doctrine that is not in the Scriptures. Amen. And if anything is being preached as doctrine that cannot be found explicitly in the Scriptures, it's not doctrine. Come on. Amen. I'm going to do what Sister Sharon says. Preach, Brother Jacob. That felt good. I see why you do it now. I want to dive into the biblical role that tradition has in the church. Because it does have a place. But it must stay in its right place or it will damage us. Come on. How many when you go to your local churches, the pastor starts off a certain way, every, or the Sunday school director starts off a certain way every Sunday? Anybody? All right. Maybe there's not. That's okay. That's a tradition for your church. You're what we call go with the flow. And then there's my mother. Before we dismiss to every class, and when I feel in for her, I, I just feel obligated to say this. Please pray for your teachers and participate in your classes. <laughs> every Sunday. It is a tradition. Amen? Anything wrong with that? No. Praise the Lord for it. A VOB march. Come on, love you. Praise the Lord. Anything wrong with the VLB march? You find it in the Scripture? Oh? No. You, you find the words VLB march in Scripture? Come on, y'all. This ain't hard. You don't find it. It's a tradition. But we thank God for it. Amen. Hey, man. Anybody see a flag, a flag pledge in Scriptures? Anybody see where the Apostle Paul was writing in his notes, and he wrote in his notes... Come on, help me preach. <laughs> or, preach, Brother Paul. <laughs> Come on. Or Matthew saying, man, Matthew was a good writer. You see anything like that? No, it's a tradition. It's a tradition for you to say, amen. It's Sister Clem's tradition to say, well. <laughs> and when she gets happy to say, thank you. It's a tradition. In every service you'll ever go to, as long as, as long as Alan Andrews is the pastor, Reedsville will end service the same way. Our children will run to the front, and if they don't, they're upset. Amen, Brother Andrews. But it's a tradition at Reedsville. They run to the front, and Brother Andrews looks for somebody to lead them and praise the Lord, and if he don't have anybody, he's going to find somebody. And we say, praise the Lord, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Every service. And sometimes, Brother Anders, we do it in conventions, in district conventions at Reesville. Because it's our tradition. Anything wrong with that? But what happens if Brother Anders, Lord help me to not fall. What happens if Brother Anders goes to Wilmington and says, You don't let your children say, Praise the Lord. <sighs> Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. Come on, help me out. Or if my wonderful mother was to say, you don't tell people to pray for their teacher and participate in their classes. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. Amen. These are all traditions, not doctrines. Would Brother Anders be right to say, Sister Odell, I heard that you don't believe that sanctification is a second definite work of grace. Need to be careful. That's doctrine. Amen, somebody. I'm teaching BTI. You want to know what you're going to get at BTI? You're going to get this. A separation of doctrine from tradition. Come on. 
I know your minds are turning. Lord, where is he going with this? We go into the Bible. Say praise the Lord. Turn with me to Mark chapter 7. Sister Kim, I'm relying on you. Are we all right? We good. Don't you love a thumbs up from the media department? Woo, praise the Lord. Verse 1. Then came together unto him the Pharisees. Right there we know. This is going to be a bad story. <laughs> then came together the Pharisees. And certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. Go on, Sister Kim. We're going to read on through this till I say stop. And when, the, and when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say with unwashed hands, they found fault. You can step right there on verse 2. Now, we're going to talk about the advice to members a little bit. These Pharisees were, and scribes knew the book backwards and forward. Amen. I knew it was going to get tight. <laughs> it's okay. I ain't even said nothing bad yet. <laughs> they knew it like the back of their hand. They knew it all. But in knowing it, it caused them to do bad things. They found fault. I wonder how many today go around checking out how long the skirts are in the church. I wonder how many today go around making sure. No, you just got pretty eyelashes. I thought that was mascara. It's okay. I wonder how many go around saying, Did you pass out your evening light this, this month? That's in the advice to members, folks. Do you attend every service? I'm talking about. Come on, help me. But in doing that, they themselves break the advice to members. Because it says, don't be a critic trying to find something in others to criticize. If you have to find something, you know what that means? You're looking for it. Come on. I have struggled with this all day, but I feel so good right now. <laughs> Thank God for liberty. I did not feel this coming, but it's here, praise the Lord. They found fault. Problem number one, they found fault. Does the scripture say they found an opportunity to teach? No. In college they have taught me in teaching that there's going to be certain times in a lesson plan where something comes up that you didn't plan. And in mine it happens a lot. Questions are asked that you didn't see coming and they call those teachable moments. Just a, a situation comes up. Somebody asks you at work about what your church believes. Teachable moment. Come on. Young person comes to you and says, Hey, can you explain this to me about the vice members? Teachable moment. Come on, help me. Teachable moment. But what the devil has tricked us into is taking teachable moments and turning them into condemnation moments. Fault finding moments. They found fault. Praise the Lord. Verse 3, Sister Kim. God bless you. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands off and eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. Verse 4. When they came, excuse me, and when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. Many other things there be which they have received to hold, as the washing of cups and pots, brass and vessels, and of tables. All right. Now, in verse 3 and 4, we ex Jesus explains the tradition, or Matthew rather, Mark, excuse me, explains the tradition to which they were holding. And can I be honest with you? I like this tradition. <laughs> How about you? Y'all to wash your hands before you eat. <laughs> Y'all to wash your pots. Y'all to wash your brazen vessels. Listen, I'm an evangelist. If I come to your home, please wash your pots. <laughs> wash your brazen vessels. Please wash your hands before you cook my food. Hey Amen. That all right? Praise the Lord. That didn't cost you nothing. My pastor always says that didn't cost you nothing. I agree with this. This particular tradition. And I don't think Jesus had any problem with this particular tradition. It was the heart behind the way they applied the tradition. 
Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? Verse 6. He answered and said unto them, said unto them Actually, let me back up. The problem here was where the concern of the Pharisees truly came from. The Pharisees were not at all concerned about the spiritual condition of the disciples. Rather that they just kept up the outward appearance of being like them. You getting that? I'm afraid some of us just want new converts into this to look the part. And we, we really don't. Let me put it this way. What we see... What ministry sees is that as long as people will conform with the things we ask them to do outwardly, we take that as a sign that something has happened inwardly. And that's backwards. That's backwards. They were fine with as long as they washed the hands, washed the pots. Hey, they're just like us. Sister Sharon, but... Brother Dwayne, actually. We found out, or y'all found out, I wasn't around, back in 1980s and early 1990s, everybody that didn't have a ring on wasn't because they didn't believe in jewelry. I've heard the stories, and you can go on YouTube today in 1992, the very next year after the ruling was changed, the VLB leader, I don't know who it is if you're here today, I'm sorry. I don't know if the man has been saved since then. I don't know. But the very next year, the man leading the VLB worship had a ring on. He conformed to what was outward as long as it was required of him. But his heart was obviously not in the right place. Because once the church said, hey, this is no longer part of our doctrine. Well, praise the Lord. I've been wanting to wear this baby for a long time. <laughs> Preach, Brother Jacob. I believe there's many Church of God people today walking around conforming to the doctrine because it was what they've always been taught. And to them, the doctrine is no more than tradition. I hope you're getting that. Because the doctrine has become tradition to them because it's just what they've always learned. There's a great benefit to those of you sitting in here that have come from outside in. Because you know what it's like to live something else. I don't. Raise your hand if you grew up in the church. Praise the Lord, but you, there is a danger in that. Because you can become so cold and calloused to the truths of God's Word the depths of his word that all of a sudden it just becomes tradition I don't know if you've noticed this but there has been a steady decline in annual in general church membership oh look there has been a gradual decline in membership and I don't know why but I tell you what I've noticed I've noticed that Many of our people have difficulty explaining why we do the things that we do. Or rather, why we don't do some of the things that we don't do. If your answer for... This is Jasmine, if a young lady comes to you and says, Sister Jasmine, can you explain to me why it would be dangerous for me to wear makeup? If your go-to... Where's my vice members? Well... In page 2, paragraph, three, par paragraph 2, your dress should be with moderation, neat and clean, not, sh not for show. There it is. Help me preach. If that's our go-to, and not 1 Timothy, somebody help me. Maybe if you're a man, because you don't know what's in 1 Timothy. I don't know. I don't know. This is funny, but my heart's broken. Because <laughs> we've got young people that are hungry for it, but we have others that don't know how to feed them. <laughs> God help us. God help me as a teacher. 
that if someone comes to me, listen, I'm not saying our traditions are wrong. I'm saying we've got to know how to teach them. God help us. Well, Brother Jacob, are you saying that it's a sin to do such and such? I don't say anything. Come on. We don't, as ministers, establish our own doctrines. We are not an independent church here and there and there. Every pastor has the obligation to come under what the General Assembly has asked him or her to do. And my job is not to say, well, my opinion, it don't matter. But Jason said, our opinion doesn't matter. What matters is that we have ministry that is grounded in this and can say, hey, this is the answer. Praise the Lord. Nowhere in Mark 7 are you going to see Jesus condemn the tradition. Go look. We don't have time. Go look. Nowhere in it does he condemn the tradition. What he condemns is the people... uh, The people and their attitude concerning the tradition. I want to focus on just three scriptures more. Sister Kim, if you could go to verse 7. This is strong right here and I hope that you love me afterwards. How be it in vain do they worship me? Let's stop right there. In vain they worship me. What does vain mean? They worship me from some place that's not from their heart. Teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. In the 74th Annual Assembly, the General Overseer addressed an ongoing problem relative to the advice to members. And in a section devoted to that subject said, For many years our Assembly Minutes have contained a section entitled Advice to Members. These instructions were prepared for the purpose of providing counsel to the members of the church to aid them in fighting the good fight of faith. From time to time, we hear of those who assume a legalistic attitude with regards to the advice to members. As though they would make commandments of the things mentioned in the advice. The display of such attitudes usually does more harm than good. A gentle spirit of teaching will be much more effective than attempts to enforce as laws those things which have been set forth as advice. Perhaps we should take a closer look at the section of our assembly minutes and at the spirit in which it was given. 74th Annual Assembly, Minutes, 1979, page 41. I hope it sinks in with you like it sunk in with me. Lord, help me not to teach for doctrines. Come on. Let me just use the words of M.A. Tomlinson. Let me not make commandments of the things mentioned in the advice. And Lord, let me have a gentle spirit of teaching that obviously will be much more effective than attempts to enforce as laws those things which have been set forth as advice. Nowhere did Jesus say the tradition was wrong. Amen. Help me preach. What he condemned was the spirit in which and the reason for which the instruction concerning the tradition was given. However, he did make it abundantly clear that this tradition was not equal to the doctrine which he was establishing. Likewise, Brother Thomason was not condemning the advice to members. He also is making it clear this advice are not commandments or biblical law. But what needs to be realized is that he was condemning the way in which the advice to members are often presented. Brother Hunter Davis, if you wouldn't mind coming here for a second. Brother Morris, would you mind coming here for a second for me? Say, Lord, bless Brother Jacob. We get down these steps. Let me tell you what we have got to do. How many knows Brother Hunter? Wave, wave your hand if you know Brother Hunter. As good a fellow as you find. Good hearted. Where's Sister Pam? I didn't think you was here. She's been singing this boy's praises for years. Good hearted as you can find. Hard working. 
Faithful, amen, to his pastor. Faithful. Wants to be used. Wants to be faithful. What I call a young, true blue that loves the Lord. How many loves Brother Morris? Also a young, true blue. <laughs> Maybe we need to get someone else, brother. You're too young. We can not. I want to make this abundantly clear. We cannot reach perfection. We look that way. You look that way. I mean, turn. Y'all see this? How many knows this is where we often find ourselves between these generations? We can not reach perfection like this. We can't do it this way either. Now y'all, come on, we're struggling right now. Pulling. Saying, you come this way. And them saying, no, you come this way. We won't reach perfection that way either. God help us. Let me tell you how we will reach perfection. Is when we know our proper place. Now, I hope you still love me after this. But I often find in our camps and our conventions that for some reason our older generation often does not feel the need to dive into the altar. I'm not talking about, bless them, Lord, bless them, Lord. I'm talking about altar working. It's called altar work for a reason. It hurts sometimes. Your knees hurt, it gets sweaty, it gets stinky. It, it is called work for a reason. We're not even... Come over here, brother Hunter. Give him a hug. We're not even going to reach perfection like this. You know how we're going to reach perfection? Is when both of these men, true blues in the young one and true blues in the old one, find a place in the altar. Lord, help me. Lord, help us. Brother Barnes, I still need you. Come on, Sister Clem. I still need you, Brother Strong. I still need you. The young people, we still need you. The old ones, you still need the young ones to carry on the message that have the energy to work. Come on. Brother West would have worked till the day he died, and he did. In his, in his bed that day. Weeks prior, Brother Dwayne went and visited him and said he was ready to establish another church. And praise the Lord for that. But we have got to bridge this tradition partition. See, in Brother Morris's, in Brother Morris's tradition, it's things like, hmm, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. But Jacob, you saying that has no place in the younger generation? No, we just added something to it. My chains are gone. I've been set free. Come on. You mean to tell me the Lord's not pleased with someone saying that their chains are gone? I'm talking about traditions. You go to Rockingham, you're going to find a completely different tradition of music than if you come to Reesville. Nothing wrong with that. You go to our Spanish churches, you're going to find a completely different tradition. I learned how to play in Spanish on the drums this year at BTI. A lot of work. Come on. You go to Waynesville, you're going to find a different tradition. You go down to the uh, Greenville Church, you're going to hear what Brother Stephen calls the Lamb Chop Band. You're going to hear all kind of different things. When we say unity, we're talking about unity through the Word. Come on. You see how these young people do this and do that? And you see how those old people, they don't want to have any fun. How do we bridge this gap? First of all, we got to talk to one another. First of all, we got to talk to one another. <laughs> Second of all, we got to pray with one another. Thirdly, we got to pray for one another. How many wants this gap to be gone? I'm not up here advocating 
that we just all worship the same way, that we all sing the same songs, that we all eat at the same places. That's the case. I hope you like Mayflower. I'm glad to come into unity on that. But I'm talking about a place where we are brokenhearted because of the gap we see. I asked earlier, do you see the gap? And everybody said yes. But when we ask, who's going to fix the gap? And you look around. I look around. Expecting for God to just magically fix it. And we wonder why we can't have a breakthrough in this convention. Because there's a gap. Come on. There's a gap. And there's even a gap sometimes in what we're looking for. The older generation knows what it means to see the blue haze. Mine doesn't. How many of you have seen the blue Shekinah glory? No offense, but y'all notice the age of these folks? I'm not joking when I say that. God help me. We got to get back. And I'm not talking about just the young people falling in line with what the older generation wants. And I'm not talking about with the older generation letting down the standard of God's holiness. I'm talking about where we start studying together again. And the young people are open-minded enough to say, hey, that older generation has something that I need. But where the older generation says, hey, this younger generation has some new ideas that maybe they're not necessarily <sighs> biblical... But they can be church tradition too. When I say they're not biblical, I don't mean that it's abiblical. I don't mean it goes against what the scripture teaches. We talked about earlier things that are not found in the scriptures, but they're church tradition. I'm talking about new things like that. Help me, please don't assume bad things. I'm not talking about bringing in things that are wrong biblically. But I'm talking about giving the young people an opportunity to express themselves and to show just how good God is to them. And I'm talking about young people still loving the old pals enough to sing old songs like Amazing Grace. How great thou art. I'm talking about bridging the gap. God is not just coming back for the young people. God is not just coming back for the old people. He's coming back for His church. I want to be a part. How about you? But Jake, you're not a part right now. Oh, I am, but he hasn't come back yet. We had a precious, precious overseer just in the past couple years, a bishop in the church, field secretary, leave because of traditions. Because of traditions. I don't want to leave this thing. How about you? I don't want to leave. I want to be in a place where I say, I'm going to stay true, I'm going to stay faithful. And as our BTI theme is, I'm going to walk by the same rule as these two. I'm going to mind the same thing. And when Brother Morris gets weak, listen, I know what it means this week to be carried and to be helped. And when Brother Morris begins to get old, he ain't there yet. Brother Hunter and I come along, and I, I can't do this right now, brother. But we carry him. And as we carry him, he says, let me teach y'all some things. Let me open the Word to you like it was open to me. Let me open up the Scriptures and the depths like it was opened up to me. And once that happens, there's no more gap in here. And we can all begin to reach a lost and dying world with the Scriptures. With the truth of God's Word. And walk in the same, by the same rule, minding the same thing. God bless you.